From Microbe TV, this is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 14, recorded on October 26, 2022. I'm Daniel Griffin, coming to you from, from New York, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So now on to the literature, shall we? Now, now, Sarah, you're actually recording from, uh, I like to say, Western Long Island. My parents call it Brooklyn, having yes. been born there. Um, but as I point out, it's Western Long Island. So yes. not very far from where I am. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do, we All have right. to do one live together. Yeah, we do, we do. We have to, we have to do that again. Yeah. All right, let's get right into viral. And remember to listen to TWIV clinical updates for uh, COVID, monkeypox, RSV, influenza, and in the future, Ebola. The article, Relative Effectiveness of Cell-Based versus Egg-Based Quadrivalent Influenza Vaccines in Adults During the 2019-2020 Influenza Season in the United States was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. And um, this is very timely, maybe not timely enough, um, but these are the results of a retrospective cohort study that was conducted using a data set linking electronic medical records with medical and pharmacy claims data among individuals greater than or equal to 18 years vaccinated with mammalian cell-based quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine or standard dose egg-based quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine. Uh, during the 2019-2020 for preventing influenza-related medical encounters. So I think that's important. Like, what are we preventing? And here it's influenza-related medical encounters um, during the 2019 to 2020 U.S. influenza season. So fewer influenza-related medical encounters, IRMEs, IRMEs, <laughs> were reported in individuals who got the cell versus the egg. Uh, the uh, Relative vaccine efficacy uh, for any ERMI was uh, was nine point five percent. Inpatient and outpatient um, relative vaccine efficacies were five point seven and eleven point four percent, respectively. Um, the authors conclude by stating results support cell-based quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine. Um, as a potentially more effective public health measure against influenza than egg-based vaccines. Um, now we need a good study looking at high-dose egg versus cell-based quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine in those 65 and over. All right. Uh, there was a supplement in JID focused on varicella vaccination program in the U.S., 25 years of saving lives and preventing illness. I actually pulled out two. There's a, a handful of articles in the supplement. The first one was clinical manifestations of varicella. Disease is largely forgotten, but it is not gone. And um, I've certainly seen a couple cases not too long ago. This was a really nice overview, and they separated it out into vaccinated and unvaccinated. And so just a one-liner, because I know many people are studying for boards, uh, the time from exposure to primary viremia is about four to six days. Then we have our classic vesicular rash about two weeks later. Sometimes you'll hear dew drops on a rose petal. And the rash typically starts in the trunk or face and then spreads peripherally outward. And then for really non-classic presentations and those who are vaccinated, this is usually a modified rash and oftentimes may not have vesicular lesions at all. Um, and then I also appreciated another one called diagnostic and immunologic testing for varicella and the area of in the era of high impact varicella vaccination and evolving problem. Um, so just a couple reminders that the presence of IgM does not confirm a primary VZV infection, whether that's reactivation from latency or reinfection. Um, and the production of IgM is also quite short-lived. So those assays have a, 
relatively poor sensitivity. And so PCR really is preferred and is the standard whether or not you're vaccinated or not. Um, and generally, we're getting these PCRs from vesicular fluid or scabs. And I, um, one of the things that authors are trying to emphasize is that if you have a patient with modified disease, that um, you can think about ways to improve the detection rate, such as pooling uh, several lesions to track to send off for that PCR. And then the last note that the commercial tests are not available to differentiate vaccine versus wild type. So that's something you'd be sending to the CDC or um, a similar reference lab. Um, and then I had one other viral paper in transplant ID, cytomegalovirus in the transplant setting, where are we now and what happens next? A report from the International CMV Symposium of 2021, which was in Amsterdam in September, of last year now, 2021. Um, and so this was just a really nice walkthrough of the various sections. So I'm not going to list everything, but I really appreciated this and thought it was a really nice way to just catch up on what are the hot topics in CMV, um, in particular, like personalized management with CMV specific uh, immune, immunity, and then some of the novel therapeutics. So um, that's a really relatively quick read to catch up on a, a huge topic. All right, moving into bacterial, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. Uh, been some good episodes lately. I will a uh, little pitch for that. Um, now, I love when I learn that what I have been doing is all wrong. <laughs> and the dogma delivered with such opprobrium is based on myths. Um, I lo also love that word opprobrium. I don't know if, if you do, Sarah. That was uh, something I learned. I had uh, to look that up. <laughs> This is that uh, that sort of vehement, you know, um, you know, how dare you say that? Uh, sort of this castate, castrate, cast, castigating. Okay, mm. all right. Mm. <laughs> Feels like the other thing is happening when it is levied upon oneself. But <laughs> this is our chance to uh, to learn, to move forward, provide better care based on science and evidence. So the article oral is the new IV challenging decades of blood and bone infection dogma, a systematic review published in the American Journal of Medicine. So here the authors sought to determine if controlled prospective clinical data validate the longstanding belief that intravenous IV antibiotic therapy is required for the full duration of treatment for three invasive bacterial infections. Osteomyelitis, Bacteremia, oh my, infective endocarditis. Uh, they performed a systematic review of published prospective control trials that compared IV only to oral steptine regimens in the treatment of these diseases. Using the PubMed database, they identified seven relevant randomized control trials, RCTs, of osteomyelitis nine of bacteremia, one included both osteomyelitis and bacteremia, and three of endocarditis, as well as one quasi-experimental endocarditis study. They found that these 21 studies demonstrated either no difference in clinical efficacy or superiority of oral versus IV only antimicrobial therapy, including for mortality. In no study, was IV only treatment superior in efficacy? Uh, the frequency, as one might expect, of catheter related adverse events and duration of inpatient hospitalization were both greater in IV only groups. A uh, couple comments. The first comment is that this is behind a paywall, which is so troubling for such an important article. Second, is that if one looks through the paper, you can see that they are largely looking at treatment with oral agents with excellent bioavailability, like fluoroquinolones, the oxazolidinone antibiotic linazolid, TMP sulfa, rifampin, um, and also, as the authors point out, a primary limitation of the meta-analysis is that many of the RCTs included were small, um, but for each disease, it was at least one large RCT um, completed within the last decade anchored the meta-analysis. All right. I want to put the article, The Burden of Bacterial Antimicrobial Resistance in the WHO European Region in 2019, a cross-country systematic analysis that was published in The Lancet Public Health right up front here. Uh, 
Now, in this study, the authors estimated deaths and disability-adjusted life years, DALIs, attributable to and associated with AMR antimicrobial resistance for 23 bacterial pathogens and 88 pathogen drug combinations for the WHO European region and its countries in 2019. Their methodological approach consisted of five broad components, the number of deaths in which infection had a role, the proportion of infectious deaths attributable to a given infectious syndrome, the proportion of infectious syndrome deaths attributable to a given pathogen, and the percentage of a given pathogen resistance to an antimicrobial drug of resistance, and the excess risk of mortality or duration of an infection associated with the resistance. Cutting to the chase, they estimated, deep breath here, 541,000 deaths associated with bacterial antimicrobial resistance and 133,000 deaths directly attributable to bacterial antimicrobial resistance in the WHO European region in 2019. So when uh, folks are just tossing those antibiotics around willy-nilly, uh, maybe treating those pseudomonal pneumonias for more than seven days, what an unconscionable act, um, start thinking about the potential impact of uh, better antimicrobial stewardship. Yeah, this next one is a little bit of a follow-up from last time when I talked about cefadroxyl. What is the appropriate dose, route, and duration of antibiotic therapy for pediatric acute hematogenous osteomyelitis? I wish I knew was published in JPIDS. Um, and this was really a comment thinking about all the components we need to predict outcomes. And I'll summarize here. One, the characteristics of the antibiotic pathogen interaction at the site of infection. Two is tissue concentration of the antibiotic during the dosing interval, which is a function of dose and half-life and tissue penetration. And then MIC. And you know, this is a point about how tissue concentrations of antibiotics and bone infections and what we understand about them is quite limited. And I learned from reading this that early studies just used bones from sacrificed animals who were given a dose of antibiotic. And then I guess the bone was ground up and then assayed for antibiotic. Um, anywho, that was not something that I was aware <laughs> of before. Um, but this article is really sort of commenting on the cefadroxyl use and how substitution of cefadroxyl for hydocephalexin cannot be automatically assumed correct or okay, uh, that we really should have data available for the concentrations of cefadroxyl at the doses that we anticipate to be necessary to treat osteomyelitis and knowing the range of MICs for cefadroxyl against our typical bug, which would be staph aureus. Um, and are we getting that proper time above MIC antibiotic exposure necessary? Um, so he, the ending is, will cefadroxyl work as step-down therapy to treat osteoarticular infections? It might, um, but really just an <laughs> argument for recommendations to be based on the PK of antibiotics and susceptibility against the likely pathogen. Um, and then sort of a side note that wouldn't it be nice if we had sort of more of a standardized surgical debridement protocol? But um, it might. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that level of confidence <laughs> moving forward, <laughs> much of the practice of infectious disease involves care of patients with bacteremia, particularly, as just mentioned, one of our favorites, Staph aureus, the golden grapes. As, uh, as such, almost any article on Staph aureus is worth looking at. So the article, How Generalizable Are Randomized Controlled Trials, or CTs, in Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia, a description of the mortality gap between RCTs and observational studies was published in CID. Um, I don't know if anyone's noticed that, just the way people seem to do better in these randomized control trials than in reality. So these are the results of a systematic review looking at RCTs and observational studies of MRSA and MSSA bacteremia um, and reported that mortality rates in RCTs were consistently lower than what we see in observational studies. So a war word of caution for applying that lower mortality or expecting that lower mortality and higher treatment success seen in RCTs with their stringent eligibility criteria and omission of early deaths uh, with what we see or expect to see at the bedside. 
All right. I think I have all of our fungal papers today. Yes, you win. <laughs> you win. And and Sarah, as you may have noticed, and this is a plug for you, if you write anything on fungi, you're going to get invited to ID Week to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, there were many uh, plugs and requests at ID Week to get young investigators and fellows and trainees involved. Um, so I, I think the ending article article of this uh, string of three will be uh, another sort of nod to that. Uh, the first one I have is in PLOS pathogens, current treatments against mucormycosis and future directions, which I kind of stumbled upon because I was reading for some recent cases and just wanted to plug that this is a very quick read about mucor that covers, I say all the antifungal agents, there aren't that many, um, but is very useful if you want to pass it along to a learner that's on your team. So as a reminder, our options are amphotericin B, which is our initial drug of choice. And there are some comments in there about you know, how oftentimes we may dose up to 10 mg per kick to start, particularly if we're worried about CNS disease. Um, posiconazole and isabuconazole have activity. And there's a nice, uh, very succinct blurb about combination therapy, which is a huge topic that we're not going to get into. Um, some potential future agents are otesiconazole. I'm actually not sure how that's supposed to you be get said. to you get to tell everyone, sir. <laughs> Everyone's listening to you. you uh, that's the stage for everyone who will only read that oh word. Oh no! Um, and then <laughs> fos manicopix. Um, but then I wrote, of course, surgical debridement in all caps because mucor really is a surgical disease in most cases. So, um, speaking of mucormycosis, you can also find investigation of a prolonged and large outbreak of healthcare associated mucormycosis cases in an acute care hospital. Arch Arkansas, June 2019 to May 2021. So this actually was one of the OFID editor's choice papers and detailed 16 patients who had healthcare-associated mucor. 38% of the patients died in hospital, and the cases were not epidemiologically linked by common procedures or products or units, you know, the room that they're in in the hospital. But they did find that there was suboptimal handling of laundered linens and inadequate environmental controls to prevent mucormycete contamination. And so rhizopus was found on 9% of 98 linens that were sampled at a hospital. So newly arrived from the laundry facility, 9% of the linens had um, signs of these mucor organisms. So a bit, a bit scary and glad that that has sort of been wrapped up. Um, so Sarah, was that supposed to be clean? Like these are fresh, clean yeah. linens just arriving from the laundry? Oh my. Yeah, it's um, scary. Um, all right. And then this last one, uh, for all those young aspiring investigators, the WHO released their fungal priority pathogens list to guide research development and public health action report. Uh, so they had a couple different categories. So I'm just going to plug the bugs that are in these top category. So critical priority, top of the list, was Cryptococcus neoformans, Astrogillus fumigatus, Candida auris, and Candida albicans. The next tier that they called high priority, oh, I'm sighing because I did this to myself, <laughs> knowing that I have to pr pronounce everything. So Candida glabrata, or its new name, Nacosomyces glabrata, you can, people are going to be upset. Sorry, guys. Histoplasma, uh, eumycetoma agents, mucorales, fusarium, candida tropicalis, and candida perapsilosis. And then the medium priority were Scetosporium, Cryptococcus gadii, Lomentospora prolificans, Tolerimyces marnefii, Coccidioides, Pneumocystis, and Candida cruzii, or Pichia cudra. Cruzii. I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> and paracoxy. So I apologize to all the mycologists about my pronunciation, but I will encourage people to still think about these because um, we, we need to learn more. You know, I'm a I'm a big fan of anytime you publish uh, with with a name like this, uh, please put in the phonetics. <laughs> you know, and, and I think we've talked about it. You know, actually, it was there was a recent book uh, by uh, Quammen, uh, Breathless, and he talked about the same issue I find with my children, where they read too much and don't talk to normal people <laughs> enough, so they pronounce things in a really odd way. And you're like, yeah, you read about that, but yeah. never actually. <laughs> 
pronounced that word yeah. before. So, all right. So that's a plug, right? Particularly mm-hmm. if you ever expect anyone to write anything on fungi, let's all get the pronunciation <laughs> in there. All right. Parasitic. Uh, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. A little plug, actually. Uh, we will be recording the next special episode of This Week of Parasitism at the annual meeting of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. We'll actually have a special guest to be announced, actually, to be determined, Ooh. to be honest. Um, but lots of parasite articles this time. Um, I will start with a truism in medicine is nur- nurses care much more about a patient's fever than do physicians. Uh, many clinicians muse about how fever is perhaps a good thing and perhaps helps with the healing process. The article, The Effect of Regularly Dosed Acetaminophen Versus No Acetaminophen, that's Tylenol, on Renal Function in Plasmodium Nolesi Malaria. Pack now a randomized control trial. That's the acronym, not that you should be packing. Um, this this article uh, published, uh, I don't even think I put where it was published, so I'll check on that in a minute. Uh, this looks at patients with a certain type of malaria, the Plasmodium nolesi. Um, this was an open-label, randomized control trial of Tylenol, 500 milligrams or 8,000 milligrams, every six hours for 72 hours versus no Tylenol in Malaysian patients aged greater than or equal to five years with nolesi malaria of any severity. The primary endpoint was change in creatinine at 72 hours. Secondary endpoints included longitudinal changes in creatinine in patients with severe malaria or acute kidney injury stratified by hemolysis. They found that although acetaminophen did improve creatinine among the entire cohort, um, it may improve renal function in patients with severest, the most severe malaria and in those with AKI and hemolysis. So it did not improve overall creatinine, but it did look like it helped the sickest among them. All right. And where was that published? Did you did you check that for me? No, Let's I didn't. <laughs> All right. All right. Sarah's going to check that. We'll get back to that. We'll insert that maybe. All right. Another article, <laughs> the value of metagenomic. Oh, it's CID. It's CID. Of course it's CID. CID. <laughs> okay. Of course it's CID. The, well, it could have been OFID, my other favorite journal. <laughs> this article was published in OFA, OFID, the value of metagenomic next generation sequencing in leash maniasis diagnosis, a case series and literature review. Now, this was really timely as I I recently had a discussion um, with a company working on making point of care CRISPR-based tests for neglected tropical diseases. So I had a long talk about the different types of leishmaniasis, such as cutaneous, the subset that has mucocutaneous potential, the visceral forms that cause calaazar or visceral leishmaniasis. But here the investigators reported on seven individuals with recurrent fever, pancytopenia, and significant splenomegaly. Three individuals, um, RK39 positive. RK39 is a rapid antigen test. They then reported on metagenomic next generation sequencing, um, and this uh, suggested visceral leishmaniasis. All were finally confirmed um, to have visceral leishmaniasis. So, um, really, really an area where there there is an opportunity for for better testing. Um, as, you know, I was having this uh, discussion with the company about a lot of these places where you go, and and I, I used um, some examples down in Panama where you go to these remote areas and you find someone with what looks like a uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis lesion. Um, and treatment is really going to be dependent on, is this leishmaniasis? What subvariant of leishmaniasis? Um, also, time I spent in India where we have individuals that were worried about Kala Azar. Um, and a lot of these individuals may make the trip to these uh, more urban, central, larger um, facilities, but that can be quite something. So uh, the ability to have these point of care um, tests really would be a tremendous advance. All right, the next, the article, Ambisome Monotherapy and Combination Ambisome Miltefacine Therapy for the Treatment of Visceral Leishmaniasis in Patients Co-Infected with Human Immunodeficiency Virus in India. A randomized open-level parallel arm phase three trial was published in CID. Uh, So these are the results, as mentioned, of a randomized open-label parallel arm phase three trial conducted in a single hospital in Patna, India. 
150 patients aged uh, 18 years of age or older with serological confirmed HIV and parasitologically confirmed visceral leishmaniasis were randomly allocated to one of two treatment arms, either a total of 40 milligrams per kilogram intravenous liposomal amphotericin B administered in eight equal doses over 24 days or a total of 30 milligrams per kilogram intravenous ambosome administered in six equal doses given concomitantly with a total 1.4 gram oral multepazine administered through two daily doses of 50 milligrams over 14 days. The primary outcome was intention to treat relapse-free survival at day 210, so we could follow up here, to find its absence of signs and symptoms of visceral leishmaniasis, or if symptomatic, negative parasitological investigations. And they found, drum roll, relapse-free survival at day 210 was 85% in the monotherapy arm and 96% in the combination arm with only 14 days of therapy. So really, really nice uh, data here. All right. Does calcified neurocystic sarcosis affect migraine characteristics and treatment responsiveness? A case control study was published in the American Journal of the Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So these are the results of a case control study that included patients migraine with calcified neurocystic sarcosis and control subjects, so migraine without calcified neurocystic sarcosis in a one-to-one -one ratio, um, headache frequency, visual analog, so VAS score, migraine disability assessment, so the MIDA score, um, was assessed at baseline and the end of three months. They reported that calcified lesions of neurocystic sarcosis in this setting are not inert and cause an increase in the frequency and severity of migraine attacks. Um, interesting, these patients also showed a better response to treatment with amitriptyline, so sort of a nice clinical pearl there. Um, but this, this comes up not only in migraines, with calcified neurocystic sarcosis, um, but also in seizures. So just uh, sort of this uh, bit of evidence that uh, just the fact that it's calcified and dead does not mean that this is necessarily inert. Yeah. Well, I'll kick off our miscellaneous section. In JAMA Network Open, I picked one, diagnostic accuracy of a bacterial and viral biomarker point of care test in the outpatient setting. Uh, so this took a look at the diagnostic performance of a point-of-care immunoassay measuring CRP, which we're familiar with, and mixovirus resistance protein A. And the test itself, I'm actually not sure how it's supposed to be pronounced. It's FEBRI diagnosis or F-E-B-R-I-D-X, um, but it's a finger stick. It takes about 10 minutes. And the goal was to differentiate bacterial from viral-associated host immune response in outpatients with symptoms of suspected acute respiratory infection. So this was perspective blinded multicenter. And in a study of about 520, the test performance uh, had sensitivity of 93%, negative predictive value 98%, specificity 88%, positive predictive value 58%, uh, which they felt for detecting bacterial associated associated host immune response. They looked at adults and kids at least one year of age. It was a convenient sample from a combination of ED and urgent care and primary care um, and had you know some exclusions like immunocompromised hosts, patients who recently had antibiotics, uh, stroke, surgery, burn, MI. I actually was trying to look into this because I hadn't heard of this test before. And from the best I could tell, the FDA has upheld a decision to not allow or to reject Lumos Diagnostics application to market this test in the U.S., um, but it does seem like it's a commercial option technically in the U.K., Canada, and Australia. So I, I don't know that we would see this test, uh, you know, is this going to, I worry about if it'll have the same problems that CRP alone has, and that that's kind of the goal of having this other um, viral resistance protein testing in there, but just thought it was an interesting thing that is floating out there if people run into it. Yeah, I'd love if there was some way. I mean, we do it with serology testing. Let's ask the immune system what's going on, yeah. and hopefully we'll reach a level of sophistication where we can say, oh, the immune system thinks there's a bacteria. It thinks there's a virus. It thinks yeah. there's both. So I'm, I'm, you know, hopefully I will live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
the article predicting airborne infection risk association between personal ambient carbon dioxide level monitoring and incidence of tuberculosis infection in South African health workers published in CID. You know, I'm often in places where there's a lot of TB. I'll admit that. Hopefully my wife doesn't listen to this podcast. Um, also, because of my life choices, I, I'm often in places where there's lots of lots of pathogens in the air that I breathe. So I'm a big fan of clean air, clean pathogen. Well, I shouldn't I shall say pathogen free, but <laughs> low pathogen um, per unit. So here the authors were investigating whether they might use CO2 monitoring to detect areas with poor ventilation and high occupancy and uh, find a correlation and dare say a suggested causal connection with healthcare workers getting infected with TB as measured with IGRA conversion rates. So what's an IGRA? That's a blood test that detects memory T cells that develop after a person gets infected with TB. Wow, kind of similar to the theme right up above, asking the immune system. Uh, they found that, yes, IGRA converters experienced higher median CO2 levels compared to IGRA non-converters. Um, the odds of a higher repeat quantitative IGRA result increased by almost twofold per hundred parts per million unit increase in median CO2 levels, suggesting a dose-dependent response. Well, my next one's not totally ID related, but kind of is. I just wanted to include this for all the doxycycline or doxynorris fans. Um, in JAMA ophthalmology, doxycycline versus placebo at 12 weeks in patients with mild thyroid associated ophthalmopathy, a randomized clinical trial. Um, so this looked at 100 patients with mild thyroid associated ophthalmopathy at five centers in China. Um, where they either got 50 milligrams of doxycycline once a day or placebo for 12 weeks and found that there was a greater improvement in symptoms for the patients who received doxycycline. You know, it's a small cohort. It's a very short follow-up, but uh, a nod to some of doxy's non-antibiotic activities, which have been used in other conditions like rosacea and bullous pemphigoid. Um, so for if you need something else to add to the list for why you like doxycycline, um, and then I had another article, Change in the Perception of Oral Antibiotics Among Medical Students After Participating in a Parenteral to Oral Conversion Program for Highly Bioavailable Antibiotics. So this was published in OFID. Medical students in South Korea reviewed the medical records of patients taking antibiotics with high oral bioavailability and wrote a recommendation for oral conversion after an ID specialist sort of confirmed the recommendation. And so they surveyed the perception of oral antibiotics in these med students who helped. Um, but I think as an overall, they looked at about 900 or so cases, about 20% were determined to be okay to switch from IV to oral. But the rate of actual oral conversion with the intervention was only 24%. So whether or not someone accepted that recommendation within 48 hours, 43% of proposals were declined or rejected, um, which is low even compared to similar studies that have been done in the past. I will note though, that this was there was no direct communication, it seems like, or, or sort of education. So that probably didn't help the acceptance rate of just sort of seeing, hey, maybe you should switch to oral. Um, but the students seem to benefit from having sort of a positive impression of switching to oral antibiotics. So the future... <laughs> Maybe we can get a higher a higher rate. I'm a little disturbed by this, Sarah, I have to say. <laughs> I'm I mean, trying so to tell myself have... it's because it was just like a note and that maybe people didn't really see it. It's a little bit different than when you go up and, and chat with a team. But yes, it's a little disappointing. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I see the bias that we keep talking about. The the idea, I was I was actually watching, I'm going to admit, I was watching a TV series, this this new uh, Apple original where, you know, the woman has an infected wound and she gets the intravenous antibiotics and now suddenly everything's all better. And I was just thinking, wouldn't it make more sense to give her a, a good oral <laughs> antibiotic with excellent bioavailability? Um, but no, no, that myth is out there. Yeah. Uh, yep. The Article, Impact of Anti-Venom Administration on the Evolution of Cutaneous Lesions in Loxalism. Um, actually, Loxosalism. 
I put a little pronunciation thing in there for myself. A prospective observational study was published in PLOS NTD. So for starters, what is loxosilism? Well, we now know how to pronounce it. Um, but basically, these are poison spider bites. Um, spiders of the genus um, Loxosceles are distributed throughout tropical and temperate regions worldwide. Um, the bites may evolve to necrosis with or without intravascular hemolysis. Um, the objective of the study was to evaluate the impact that antivenom administration might have on the evolution of the cutaneous loxosceles. Um, I will tell you, uh, don't let your children see you reading this article. The, the photos are gory. Uh, perhaps this is something you can leave out for Halloween. Um, but these are really horrible, horrible destructive lesions. So these are the results of a prospective observational study carried out at a referral center for envenoming didn't know such things existed, but over a six-year period, they included 146 patients with a presumptive or definitive diagnosis of loxoxalism. Depending on the symptom severity, a polyvalent anti-arachnid antivenom was administered or not in 74 cases, so 50.7% and 49.3% respectively. Cutaneous and systemic manifestation were assessed at admission and weekly thereafter. Um, adverse reactions to the antivenom were also evaluated. Um, cutaneous loxosceles was observed in 96.6%, and the spider was identified in only 19.9. Um, you know, people, I've been in like centers where like people all bring in the snake that bit them, um, but sometimes it's a little harder to grab the, grab the spider. So the mean time from bite to antivenom administration was 41.6% plus or minus 27.4 hours. So quite a bit of time. After discharge, 90.9% .9 were treated with corticosteroids, antihistamines, um, analgesics as needed. The probability of developing necrosis, they say was significant, and I'm going to say statistically significant lower among patients who received antivenom in the first 48 hours. They give us a p-value of 0 0.0245. Um, there's a nice table five. When you can sort of see, you know, getting the bite, getting the antivenom in that in that first 24 or 48 hours, really, um, you know, 51.1% versus 73.2. So not quite the magic that I would like uh, it to do. So there we are. Careful of them <laughs> spiders. Uh, well, it's a good ha Halloween ending. <laughs> uh, that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Podcast at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv microbe forward slash podcast. We love to get your questions, comments, paper suggestions, um, feedback on pronunciation. <laughs> Send them to puscast at microbe.tv and consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute. I, I think a lot of our listeners are, are well-to-do physicians, so you, know, you got a little extra money. This will help on the taxes. So go to that website and help us today. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong at Febrile Podcast or at febrilepodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, other podcasts. This week in parasitism, this week in virology clinical updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you and dictation and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. Mm -hmm.